What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will cover the complete life of CC5052, also known as Commander Bly. We will see each and every moment in chronological order, from birth, training, the Clone Wars, and into the Imperial Era. We will see how he differed from many of his clone brothers, and also examine his relationship with Aayla Sakura. At times, they do talk to each other harshly, but they had such a strong bond that at least one Jedi General warned Mace Windu about them being too close for their own good in this time of war. Despite this, we'll see that the one thing the Commander and the General had most in common was their determination to see every mission completed with an incredible efficiency. Like all of his brothers, he would be bred on Kamino, grown from the genetic template of the most deadly bounty hunter in the galaxy, Jango Fett. CC stands for Clone Commander, and these beings were genetically designed to be commanders within the Grand Army of the Republic, having a greater propensity for individual thinking and leadership than your standard trooper. This type of unit would also receive much more intensive combat and psychological training in order to have both mastery over every weapon and vehicle, but also understand the minds of their brothers. Like we saw with Commander Wolf, who had to use this kind of psychological training to keep troopers from deserting and stay motivated as warriors of the Republic. CC5052 would become a clone marshal commander in charge of an entire corps. The 327th Star Corps, which contained 36,864 soldiers, with Bly second only to his Jedi General. Other notable martial commanders include Bakara, Cody, and Neo. These CCs would be trained personally by the leader of the first batch of the ARC Troopers, Alpha 17 of the Alpha ARCs. This first batch was deemed to be too independent and reckless to be mass-produced but their leadership went a long way in developing the skills of the clone commanders, even starting the practice of giving clone nicknames to further develop their sense of individuality, CC5052 now going by the name Bly. This training program would be finished off with martial commanders mastering planetary and even system-wide movement of troops. As the more than 36,000 troops under Bly's command would fill up more than 18 Venators, or over two Acclimators. In the year 22 BBY, Bly would be thrust into the fight that he and all of his brothers had been bred for, when Yoda rallied the secret clone army to assault Geonosis and save the Jedi Task Force that had just been overwhelmed. Bly and the 327th Star Corps would play a major role in the Republic victory in this opening battle of the war, and they actually ended up rescuing Aayla Sakura, the Twi'lek Jedi that would be assigned as Bly's general. The galaxy would be split into 20 sectors, each with its own sector army, and the second sector would be headed by Jedi General Rai Gaul and Grand Moff Fleury Viru. The second sector army was split into four cores, with one of them being Sakura and Bly's 327th. In between missions, Bly and Gree would work with Eeth Koth and Aayla Sakura in the droid maintenance room of the Jedi Temple. These elite clones using some of their specialized training to help the Jedi capture and extract intel from the Separatist battle droids. Quite a backlog of droids that need their memory cores unlocked, then wiped. The secrets these droids might hold could be a key to the war effort. Their next mission would be to take this droid cracking to a new level by capturing an important tactical droid. They set up a Republic Information Bunker decoy, a structure that sent out data making it seem like a hidden communications or server room. A high-ranking and tenacious T-Series was commanding a group of droids, including a squad of powerful B2s. Bly was with a small squad and viewing the clankers through his helmet visor macro binoculars. While one of his troopers was voicing doubts that they might be doing all of this just to get an empty box, Bly silences this just as the B2 fires a rocket that blows down the doors and allows the T-Series to walk in with technician droids. Immediately, they realize that all the data banks are empty, and in this pause of disbelief, Bly and the boys had raced into the canyon and were firing on the super battle droids. Making their way through the ranks of tinnies, Bly orders them to drop droid poppers on the B1s, but they couldn't hit the tactical droid, just try and get him to run back inside, right into the blue blade of the Jedi General. Ayla severing the head in a flash, and when Bly and the men regroup, we see that their plan was executed so quickly that the droid couldn't execute cyberostasis. Its memory banks were still intact, and they would soon be able to extract crucial CIS intel via a robo-lobotomy. The following year, the Separatists would start to dominate the Outer Rim territories, in a stunning series of attacks that would eventually lead to nearly complete control of this region. Bly was leading the defense on Quell, but their fleet of three Venators was being blown apart by a fleet of Munificents descending on them. Ayla's flagship was all that remained, and they were trying to hold on long enough for reinforcements to arrive, as swarms of flying super battle droids were pouring in. Commander, get out there and stop those droids! I'm on it! Anakin, Ahsoka, and Rex with the 501st were swooping in to try and evac them, descending in LAATs with their Venator and Charger C-70 on the way. 
Anakin would take a creative way down using the droids themselves, while Ahsoka and Rex made a crash landing. Bly and Ayla were trapped in the passageway, who's blasting away with dual DC-17 pistols, while Skywalker's forces make it in just in time to save them, and they rush to the docked charger. But the tactical droid was willing to lose all of his droid units in order to take out the Venator and Jedi aboard. The Munificents fire all of their cannons, and Anakin decided to force push his allies into the docking tube while trying to hold the doors back. Bly rushes to take command of the ship while the Jedi help their brother on board. I'm gonna turn on the deflector ship! They race away from the exploding Liberty, but on their way to salvation, they are intercepted by vulture droids, firing on the bridge and causing an explosion that takes out the co-pilot, his head slamming into the hyperdrive computer and locking in coordinates. Shut it down! I can't! Ayla orders them to detach. If they didn't, they would have ripped apart both ships in an instant. But now they had no idea where they were headed. Passing through the blue void of hyperspace, Bly comes into the med bay to relay the bad news. General Sakura, we have a problem. What is it, Commander? And, well, we're headed right for a star. Their only hope is to cut off all power, ripping them out of hyperspace, but hopefully it'll give them enough time to maneuver around this star. This would also cut off Anakin's life support, but it was the only way. They are tumbling, sending everyone but Ahsoka and Bly off their feet, making the commander call out in a panic to engage the power. Switch the power back on! What are you waiting for? It was a close call, but they were able to steer out of the collision course, but were now burning up and falling apart as they approached the planet Meridun. The Charger barely held together, but all of the Republic forces did survive. They rushed off to get to work setting up a camp, and Bly watches as Ayla explains the difficult task that Ahsoka must leave behind her master in order to help them find a way off-world. She is frustrated at first, but understands, and as they pack up, Bly discovers some sort of artifact that is clearly not natural. General Sakura, look. We're not the only ones here on this planet. They would march into the night, coming upon a massive tree like that in the inscription Bly found. But massive pods fell off and nearly killed them though they did notice a path through the tall grass that seemed to be from one of these pods being dragged off to what they hoped would be a native village. Unknown to these off-worlders, they were being stalked by the Mastiff Phalons. Massive dog hawk beasts that leapt out and started devouring them. Bly was able to kill one of them, but his brothers Cameron, Lucky, and Flash would succumb to their wounds. The survivors would sprint along the trail, and as the sun was rising, they finally set eyes on the Meridun village. But the leader Tiwak Ka is not happy to see these warriors. We need your help. Violence breeds violence. Jedi are no peacekeepers. We colonize this system to find solace from your wretched war. The villagers agree to help Anakin and get them off world, but the leader says that the clone cannot stay in the village. Bly and Ahsoka go with the leader's son, Wag 2, who is the village's healer. When they get to the crash site, they see a pair of Mastiff Fallons had just knocked out Rex, and Anakin was about to be devoured. The native jumps in to show Ahsoka how to take down the beast without killing it, while Bly attended to the barely conscious Skywalker. With Rex recovering from the attack, Bly and Ahsoka would be the ones to carry Anakin to the Lerman village, and he would be treated and back on his feet by the next day. That following morning, we see Bly helping the villagers with some tasks and enjoying a local fruit, before the serenity of this village is shattered by a C-9979 landing craft. The enormous ship could deliver a planetary invasion force and prefabricated bases. Notice Bly is the higher ranking clone, giving orders to Rex as the Marshal Commander. Coming straight our way. Acknowledged. Get back here. General. Yes, Commander. We've got a Separatist ship incoming. The healer would help the offworlders to escape into the tall grass, while the leader went out to greet General Locke Durd. A greeting that was followed by blaster fire and ransacking the pacifist Lermans. Anakin realized this invasion could be their ticket off-world, and as they were planning how to capture a shuttle, Ahsoka spots a recon droid that had discovered them. Bly and Rex jump up and open fire, and then Bly activates a jammer. They would chase it through the grass, and eventually Ayla would be able to destroy it. This chase actually worked in their favor, as the droid was trying to get back to the pop-up CIS base. From the vantage point on one of these enormous trees, they were able to scout out the entire area and plan the infiltration after sunset. But they also witnessed the testing of a prototype defoliator tank, which burns away miles of terrain with ease. Locked Durd hoping to test his weapon on the Lerman village. And this test almost cost Bly his life, if it wasn't for Ayla swooping in at the last second to rescue him. That night, they used the cover of dark to approach, and they split up into teams, Ahsoka and Sakura sneaking in to open the main door, allowing Anakin, Rex, and Bly to move in. Droids were dispatched without alarming the entire base, and as they run towards the shuttle, they spot portable shield generators. 
All know that these could prove invaluable to the Lerman in this coming fight against the Separatist Inferno. They land and try to warn the leader again, but he insists that his people would rather be slaughtered than fight back. That following morning, the Jedi decide to set up a perimeter of those massive seed pods and place the shield generators close to the village. Rex would be spotter, and when they saw the CIS forces approach, Bly and Ahsoka activate the shields and prepare for a fight. When the incendiary round is fired, the villagers watch as the flames die out over the shield, now certain that if it wasn't for the help of these clones and Jedi, they would have all suffered a painful and pointless death. Unable to fire through the shields, Durd sends in the droids, and though Bly and company are able to keep them back for a while, eventually their sheer numbers allow them to break through and blow the shield generator to bits. The droids are destroying the pacifist settlement, and finally the leader's son rallies his fellow Lerman to fight back. Clones, Jedi, and Lerman work together to neutralize the clankers, while Anakin was able to take out the prototype and capture Lok Durd. Not long after, Bly and Rex use the shuttle to contact the Republic, and a trio of Venators appear to rescue them. This mission would be followed by an investigation into reports from their slimy ally Jabba the Hutt, who is complaining of Separatist activity in his sector of space. Can we really trust Jabba? Trust in his greed. We can. This ice world was Aslock 3, the homeworld of the Tal species. A munificent class frigate had made a crash landing, and something had created a gravity anomaly. Ayla Sakura and Luminara Unduli were with a squad of their troopers led by Bly and Gree. As they make their way across the terrain with the versatile ATTE, climbing up sheer glacier walls, they eventually make it to the bridge of this downed capital ship, where they see shards of ice floating in this gravitational field. Clones would use their jetpacks, and the Jedi would call on the Force to help them make their way closer. And as they navigate through the wreckage, Bly is the first one to spot the enemies springing their ambush. Vultures, take cover! The Vulture droid shows how they could operate as a deadly anti-personnel land vehicle as well as a starfighter. But by using their sabers to deflect bolts and then sever its droid brain, they make their way into the main terminal of the ship. Bice into the main computer, Commander. Look for any clues about what happened here. I'm on it, General. We've got company! The Republic forces have to hold this wave of clankers off before they can finally get the records of what took place on this frigate. The day won't come when the droid army can outfight us without a 10 to 1 advantage. 20 to 1! Gree does the slicing, and they see that a ship docked with the Munificent, and shortly after it departed, the cruiser exploded. As they look into the ship register, they see two prototype devices were on the down frigate, and that perhaps this visitor stole the other one. Before they can speculate too long, Gree sees that the hollow recorders picked up Ventress's arrival at the site. What's that Sith witch doing here? Records show she's activating the ship's self-destruct. Don't wait for us. We're right behind you. Okay, rocket jockeys, fire up your jets. Let's move! Bly and the rest of the clones would make it back to the ATTEs, and Luminara and Ayla would nearly kill Ventress, though she did ultimately escape. After this, the 327 Star Corps came across a bounty hunter ship that was being fired upon by a Munificent, and when Bly wanted to recon the planet more, this mission eventually saw Bly in a gunship shooting down several hyena droids sent after him, as well as that bounty hunter ship belonging to the Weequay Shahan Alama. Still in the second year of the war, the Mandalorian Protectors had launched an attack on a mid-rim world, one which held symbolic importance for the Republic and Jedi Order. The world New Holstice contained a monument to all Jedi that were killed since the very formation of the Republic. Thousands of years of Jedi history memorialized on this world. These Mandalorian Protectors were a faction group of the civil servants and royal guards of the Mandalorian royalty. It's unclear how this would be perceived by the Mandalorian leaders, especially with Duchess Satine's want to stay out of the Clone Wars completely. But this battle would be extremely violent for both sides, with the Mandalorians finally driven off only after the 327th lost 40% of their troops. And Ayla reassures Bly that they will have to make do for now. That as much as they would hate to admit it, these losses were becoming common across the galaxy. Jedi General Arlegan Zay was noticing how close a bond Ayla and Bly had formed. It is important to remember that there are thousands of active Jedi at this time, hundreds of Jedi leading troops into combat every day, and although we see the friendships with Plo, Anakin, Kenobi, Yoda, and their troopers, there had to be a bell curve of affection. So General Zay is pointing out to Master Windu his concerns with Sakura's leadership, saying, quote, Master Windu, I respect clone troopers as much as any Jedi, and perhaps even more in some cases, but a certain distance is required from our troops, clone or not. 
General Sakura is becoming a little too close to Commander Bly, and while I applaud her dedication to the men under her command, this can only end in tears." End quote. So Sakura and Bly did not have an adversarial relationship. In fact, they were so close that it worried other high-ranking Jedi. But this next mission would show that Bly did not see all Force users this way. A Confederate Corps ship named Gehenna was shot down over the planet Honegger, and it was transporting a powerful new defoliant toxin called Trihexalapine 1138. The CIS intended to use this on Naboo to destroy the ecosystem, and if successful, they hoped to destroy the breadbasket worlds of the Republic, starving them into a surrender. Jedi General Raiki N's ship was also heavily damaged, and when both ships crash-landed, his forces were able to confirm that the package containing the 1138 data was moved into an ancient Rakata temple, taken there by the native species, the Nagri. The general was able to pass this info to Sakura's forces before he was killed by these native reptilians. After Ayla and Bly recon the temple, they planned to sneak in and out before the natives spot them. But the hail of blaster fire puts an end to this, and they all scramble into a defensive position. Bly thinking about how this tactic sacrifices his brothers, as the furthest clone out draws fire and tries to lay down some suppressing fire, repeated by each of the clones furthest out from their formation, in order to save the majority of their squad. The general and commander were fine for now, but could sense the swarm surrounding them. Bly would take a glancing blow to the helmet, and try to keep up the fight from the ground. And just as Ayla seemed like she was about to fall, bolts came in from the darkness to save them. Saber and blaster fire were raised at the mysterious figure, who steps forward to reveal himself as Quinlan Voss. Ayla's old master, who at this point was believed to be a rogue Jedi. Bly has his rifle aimed at Voss's head, asking for permission to shoot Dooku's lieutenant. After Ayla denies this, at least for now, Voss says he can explain the apparent defection, but not in front of the clone. To which the general replies, quote, He won't say anything if I order him not to. Bly has my complete trust. End quote. Showing how close their bond was at this time. But her old master hints that she does not know the whole story. She can't assume anything about the clones. And while her old master was trying to get her to understand that he had not fallen, Bly wasn't buying it. We see the first signs of this intense psychological conditioning and genetic manipulation. That he raises his weapon to the enemy of the Republic, saying his orders are clear. He must kill this traitor, even though his general already gave him direct orders to the contrary. Again, she reminds the Marshal Commander that she is his superior. She will obey him, and reluctantly, Bly agrees. And he thinks to himself, quote, My reluctance to obey the general surprises me. It never happened before. We're taught to trust our instincts. They are what kept the Prime, Jango Fett, alive for so long. And his other thoughts show us that he is able to go against his instincts in order to obey a superior's commands. He would be a good soldier and follow his orders. But he didn't have to be nice to Voss. When Voss explains the plan, Bly gets in his face and tries to find out why they need to trust him. With his general agreeing on the plan, Bly rushes to locate the SIP containing the 1138 data, attracting the Nogri fire while the Jedi slice them and their droids to pieces. And surprisingly, after the smoke cleared, Bly thought to himself that Voss's plan would have been a better strategy from the beginning, that perhaps his brothers didn't have to die in that first wave. We again see Bly focusing on the efficiency of Voss's tactics, frustrated at how the Jedi's ethics cost clone brothers lives. Something that we saw with the Devil Dogs when they joined with Plo Koon's forces. The Devil Dogs were so much more efficient by not working as much with these meditative monks turned warriors. When Voss executes a helpless Nogri, Ayla is shocked, but Bly agrees with Voss's rationale, thinking, quote, Much as I respect the general, I was forced to agree with the renegade. End quote. Voss uses his psychometric powers to see the history of an object by touching it, and he sees that the door to the main room of the temple is booby trapped. He knows how to open it, but they have Bly on lookout for any disruptions. While Ayla has to focus deeply on the Force to pull the package toward them in an instant, she moves as fast as she can, but the trap mechanism is activated and fires a barrage of poison darts. The general calls out to her commander in what might have been the final instant of her life, and he whips around in time to cry out hopelessly. There was nothing they could do but have faith in the Force, and luckily, the Jedi were both unharmed if not exhausted. And now with the intel on this powerful bioweapon, they weren't out of the swamp yet. It would be a dangerous and even more exhausting trek through the mucky terrain, all while fighting off pockets of natives just to come to a dead end on a massive cliff. A crimson blade is ignited, and Voss confirms their worst suspicions. He says he will let them live if his old Padawan just gives up the intel. 
Ayla's blue blade is ignited, and Voss pleads with her, saying this was still a part of the Council's plan. He was just trying to gain Dooku's trust, but that he was close to learning the identity of the true puppet master of the Clone Wars, the secret Sith that Dooku called Master. Bly was not interested in any speech, and pulled the trigger on his blaster rifle. But in that split second before he could get the shot off, the air in front of him became as hard as a fist, Bly thinking to himself that he had taken blaster shots that hurt less than this force push. An attack that smashed Bly's head against a stone wall, making him black out instantly. Moments later, he would regain consciousness, being met with the smell of ozone and the sound of sabers colliding, looking up to see the Jedi in a blur. He wanted to take a shot, but knows he might hit Sakura, thinking to himself the protocol that had been drilled into him since birth. Quote, achieve the objective, protect your commander, protect the unit, protect yourself, in that order. He then felt his consciousness slipping, and the rifle was just too heavy to lift, as he passes out again. Voss was still trying to get Ayla to give up the SIP and just leave, but the Padawan needed to teach her master a lesson. She was driving him mad by pointing out how the dark side was making him rationalize for evil. She dropped down and hoped to call his bluff, show him that he was not willing to kill her, that she still cared for him, but in this moment of pause, a blaster bolt melted its way through his shoulder. Bly had found the strength to get off a shot, and Voss leapt into his awaiting ship, while Bly desperately tried to stay on target, firing the rifle with one hand as his left arm was smashed to pieces. When her old master was gone, Ayla starts to say that she wishes he hadn't intervened. She thought she could have brought him back from the brink of darkness. They were able to get a signal to a Venator in orbit, being extracted via LIAT before the natives could devour them. And once on board, Yoda shares accounts from Mace Windu that all seem to confirm Quinlan Voss had fallen to the dark side. When Ayla rejoins Bly, he tells her that the package was delivered to Republic Intelligence. And as they prepare for their next mission, we see that Bly is thinking about how different he was from his general, noting that her distress must be due to her connection with this renegade master, that completing the mission should be all that matters. And he says to himself, quote, her connection with the renegade, it's a flaw in her armor. Maybe it's a flaw in mine. Those kinds of connections, not a color I see. That's okay. Better off that way. Know the mission, know your enemy, achieve the mission, kill the enemy. That's all I need. It's all any soldier needs. Get the order, and execute it. These are interesting insights into the mind of a clone that did have such a close relationship with his general, to the point that other less affectionate Jedi were concerned. And still, he snaps back into a confusion about why emotions would matter at all, when there is a clear order to follow, and a mission to complete. After this, the 327th would conduct a short investigation on Anzat, the home of the Ben Purik and Zadi species, and they would then move to aid Republic forces and finish the fight at the Battle of Altar V. The Separatist attack had been so deadly that the Jedi in command was vaporized by turbo laser fire. The commander was also killed, as well as the majority of the troopers, leaving a trooper captain named Devas to take up the mantle and form a counterattack taking leadership of the Republic forces on world. This attack proved successful, and provided one of the most shocking reversals and dramatic Republic victories of the war. Bly and his corps would arrive after this heroic trooper had taken out the Ion Cannons, and after the CIS forces retreated, Bly promoted Devis all the way up to a clone commander. We are now in the final year of the war, 19 BBY, and Bly's forces would be deployed to Seleucami. Here, the Republic was already well into a siege that was trying to get into the planet's capital. Under the capital was a vast series of caves that were home to the Separatists' attempt at building a clone army. The Morgakai warriors, instead of being humans raised by Jedi and Mandalorians, these were Nyctos, trained in the dark arts by the Anzadi. The Republic forces were led by Apurancis, with the returned Quinlan Voss as second in command. Ayla provides aerial support with her Etta too and they were able to take over a great deal of Republic territory. That night at the Republic camp, Bly approaches Voss to tell him that Sakura wanted to speak with him, but the Jedi still doesn't trust the clone, and reminds him that the last time they met, he tried to kill him, and Voss says he was too busy to talk with his old Padawan. He wanted to meet with Apparancis to talk about Jedi Master Tholm, who had gone missing, but both Voss and Ayla sensed that he was still alive. Thome was the master to both of them at one point, and before they talk about it further, she sends Bly to go with Commander Fey to check on the Starfighters. The two Jedi talk about the events from their last mission, and he admits that the darkness had overtaken him to the point that he may have killed her if Bly hadn't found the strength to get off those shots. But Ayla assures him that she will always be there for him, all of the Jedi convinced that he was still on their side. 
fighting the pull to the dark side that came with his deep undercover mission. The next day, the fighting would move into the capital, and the force wielders would sneak into the palace compound, while the clones blasted their way through the Morgakai outside. As they fought through, they eventually regroup, but Bly is still nervous about Voss, pointing out that he has slipped away, though Ayla believes that they can trust him this time. We see that Voss had confronted Dark Acolyte Toll Score, only to have them turn off their sabers when out of sight, and they casually stroll into a secret area to meet with Sora Bulk, a fallen Jedi Master corrupted by Dooku. The Count tells Voss that he needs him to hunt down Master Thulm and kill him, even if that ruins his cover with Aborancis. But before he could strike down his master, the old man would be taken out by volcanic explosions. And at this same time, Rancis had been killed by Soya Bulk. Ayla is deeply hurt, but they bury Oppo and prepare for the final attack, now without the advantage of the master's battle meditation. Commanders Bly, Neo, and Faye all develop a battle plan and rush in with the Juggernauts, while Ayla led the fighters and escorts. The plan was to use this massive assault to distract the majority of the forces, while Ayla and Voss flew to a location to access the caves containing the cloning chambers. Charges were planted, causing the geothermal devices to spew magma throughout the tunnels, which incinerated everything in their path, including the CIS clone birthing chambers. This also disables the shield generator, and Bly and the boys rush forward to contain the Morgukai warriors. Clone versus clone battle above, while down in the cave, Jedi were fighting to save fallen Jedi. Ayla would use her connection to help Voss stay in the light as he battled Bulk. And once Bly's forces took out the massive ion cannon, the Venator in orbit was free to open fire on the base. The turbo laser bolts ripping through the structure as the Jedi scrambled to make it out of the kill zone. After the smoke cleared, the threat of these CIS clones was completely eliminated, and Bly tells Ayla that Command has given them orders to move to Felucia. Quinlan was headed to Ba's pity, and before they separate, Ayla jokingly tells him to trust his clone commander. Quote, they usually do all the hard work, right Bly? To which he simply replies, copy, I'll get right to it, General. But before they can make it to Felucia, they are ordered to investigate a mysterious disappearance at a small outpost on Endor. Bly informs his general that the Separatist location is deserted, but they had lost contact with the recon team. One trooper shouts out to call them over to a pile of mangled droids and smashed pieces of clone armor. The general tells Bly to secure the area, while she scouted out on her own. A B-1 ambushed her, but she got the upper hand, only to be struck in the neck by an Ewok sleep dart. She awakens in a treehouse village surrounded by spear-wielding monsters. The limbless battle droid tells the Jedi that he will be happy to see her get eaten, but luckily the Ewoks are trying to get her help showing a clone trooper helmet, and the B-1 says that his droids and the clones were all killed by a giant beast. The majestic-looking blue-skinned Twi'lek was thought to be a forest spirit, and they hoped that she would help them in this battle. After they trek into the mountain, Ayla would get herself into a battle with an enormous spider-like creature, but she eventually is able to defeat it and reports back to Bly. Ayla tells her commander that this problem is gone, including the Separatist presence though she is alarmed at the rate of these small CIS outposts being put up on remote worlds, saying this needs to be discussed with Yoda once they finish their mission on Felucia. In their Venator, the Intrepid, and in route to Felucia, Ayla sees that Bly is still frustrated by the events on Seleucami. The loss of the Jedi, so many clones, the mystery of the secret Sith, and Bly was still uneasy with Voss. But she doesn't want to talk about it, joking he is supposed to just follow orders, right? So just move on to the next task. She just wanted to work out, and while they spar, she explains that Windu has given her command of more troops, and that they are to hunt down Separatist Council member Shu Mai and rescue Barriss Afi. Later we see that along with the troops came the Jedi Padawan Akriya, who was an excellent slicer. Right after this introduction, they get a call from Yoda calling for all Jedi to return if possible to aid in the defense of Coruscant. The most dreaded fear of the Clone Wars was finally realized. The Separatists were throwing the largest invasion force at the homeworld of the Republic. And Ayla Sakura snaps in an uncharacteristic display of anger and frustration, yelling, quote, The heart of the Republic is under attack, and we're wasting our time going to Fungus World. When Bly explains these Outer Rim sieges must have been a trap to lure resources away from Coruscant, she shouts at him, quote, I am no clawfish, Commander Bly. Get me back to the capital. Now. Bly stays respectful and explains that they should finish their mission. And the Slicer says that if they capture Shumai, perhaps they could make her give up intel that could be useful to the defense of Coruscant. And Bly says that he just cares about not getting another incomplete mission on his record. 
When they finally do reach Felucia, Bly, Ayla, and the new Padawan make their way through the fungal jungles to recon the detention facility. Once they see their way in, they rush the droids and intimidate the Warden into leading them to Barriss. They try to make their way outside, only to find a massive droid force. Thousands of battle droids with dozens of vehicles. But with a call to backup, Bly's strike team providing this intel to the rest of the 327 Star Corps on their Venator, their forces were able to come in with a swarm of fighters, bombers, and transports that turned these droid formations into a scrap heap. From here, they were off to capture Shu Mai, rushing straight for her compound. B2s and dwarf spider droids stood guard, but they were quickly handled, and Bly's speeder bike team got the all clear. Racing towards the compound, vulture droids pick up on them, and were about to rain down laser cannon fire before ARC-170s swooped in and kept Bly's bikers safe. Ayla's team were able to make their way into the facility, but find that it was left open, nothing locked, no guards, and all the logs show that the Separatist leader had escaped. They do find that a holonet connection was still intact and Ayla demands to see reports from Coruscant, still torn if she was off on some trivial task while the true fighting was occurring over the home of the Jedi. Relieved, she sees reports saying that Anakin, hero with no fear Skywalker, and Obi-Wan, the negotiator Kenobi, were able to destroy Grievous' flagship. Bly interrupts to warn them that something is in the air, a sort of toxin, and then the Padawan notices a transmission. Thinking how they got in here so easily, they realize this must be a self-destruct signal. Bly and the boys escaped fine, but watched the Shumai compound go up in smoke and flames. We see in a hollow call back to the temple that Ayla survived, but many clone brothers did not make it out of the explosion. Mace Windu tells her to bring the entire 327th back to Coruscant. Their mission was complete, and if Kenobi's mission was a success, that would be the end of the entire Clone Wars. Despite hearing that these years of loss would finally come to an end, Ayla cannot pull herself to leave knowing what Shu Mai just released into the ecosystem on Felucia. With the self-destruction, the Separatist rigged toxins to release into the planetary aquifer. In four days, almost all life on this world would come to an end, and Windu agrees that they cannot let a genocide play out. All of the remaining CIS forces on world were set to defend the water treatment facilities in an attempt to deny Republic intervention. Each of the Jedi split up to lead separate clone forces through the jungle in order to avoid any droid starfighter superiority. As they made their way through the bioluminescent terrain, Bly and his beloved commander talk about how this may be their final mission. And the Jedi General asks, quote, So Commander Bly, what will you do when this war is over? Getting the simple reply, Whatever I'm ordered, of course. Ayla sighs and realizes that in some ways, the Jedi are just like these singular-minded troopers. That at the end of the day, their philosopher-warrior order filled with high ideals still had a hierarchy and orders that they had to follow as well. Meanwhile, other forces were experiencing heavy opposition and suffering casualties. Bly gets hailed on his comms, while Ayla experiences a disturbance she thinks must be related to the Padawans in danger. Some of those Padawans were looking through Bly's helmet-based hollow recorder. That hacker using this to find where their Jedi General was located, and they looked on as the clones fell back and surrounded Ayla. Bly had just received a direct order from the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic, stating that the Jedi Order was involved in a coup to take over the Republic. Bly had his order, and he would follow it. His inhibitor chip activated, and he and his men unloaded on their general. Countless blaster bolts to make sure that this force-wielding traitor did not have a chance. They had seen how powerful she was in these mysterious arts. Bly had nearly been killed by her master, Voss, pummeled by the invisible force which broke his bones and knocked him unconscious, by the man that trained Ayla, a man who was just another one of the Jedi that supposedly fell, just like the Separatist leader, Count Dooku. It was all starting to make sense now. Covered in her own blood, CC-5052 commands his troops to check her body and ensure that there was no chance of Jedi trickery. He would be frustrated to find that after killing the general that he had so much respect and love for, even after following that order, this mission was still an incomplete on his record, as the efforts to stop the toxin's release were abandoned, and those Jedi Padawans escaped. A year later, in 18 BBY, Darth Vader was working with his Inquisitors to hunt down the survivors of Order 66. The two names on their list were Akria and Logan, with their third Padawan friend Zonder having already been killed by this new Sith Lord. Vader pulls a record that these two Padawans escaped on Felucia, and finds that two of the clones involved were still serving the Empire. 
relegated to working riot control on the planet Yatusk, they hail Commander Bly and Lieutenant Gale. Vader knows how the clone mind works, and immediately pulls on his sense of honor, saying that the commander had some incompletes on his record, and asked if he would like to reduce that number. 5052 simply replied, Yes sir. When the commander is brought before Imperial officers, they doubt his claim that a Padawan could ever compromise their systems, and he replies asking if the Imp has ever worked with a Jedi. The other Imperial officer thinks up a way to track her within the system, and moments later they are able to find them and use an LAAT gunship to give pursuit, with Bly in a squadron of V-Wings. This Clone Wars vet using Republic equipment to shoot down the young Jedi's vessel. A Kriya leapt to safety, but Logan fell to a platform where the Sith Lord and his Inquisitors were able to capture him and pack him onto their shuttle. A Kriya was able to sneak in and follow Vader, laying in wait for a chance to free her friend, while Bly was monitoring her access point tracker and rushed in to force her from her hiding spot. The Jedi ignited her saber, but these clones had killed the Jedi closest to them, their own friends. And when 5052 ordered his men to fire, their bolts found their mark before she could react. As she fell to the ground, tears and rage flowed from her friend, and he called on the Force to send the entire clone squad crashing into the Durasteel walls. This was his second severe concussion brought on by a Jedi Force push, and he was out of it for most of Logan's fight with the Sith Lord. Vader let the fight drag on to feel on the boy's fear, and guide him towards the end of a long walkway. With the commander regaining consciousness, he sees this last Jedi on his incomplete record, raises his blaster, and puts a bolt into the boy's shoulder that breaks his guard, and allows Vader to strike. The Padawan's eyes filled with tears, apologizing to his slain Jedi friends, knowing he could not keep his promise, before falling into the void. Vader and Bly meet, and the Dark Lord says that his mission was finally complete, and with that, they return to Coruscant, the commander happy to get this incomplete off his record, though all the Imperials were unaware that these Jedi targets had survived. The ultimate fate of Bly is still unknown, but it is believed that he would spend the rest of his life in service to the Empire. Unlike his brothers Rex, Gregor, and Wolf, his fate is believed to be more along the lines of Cody perhaps being integrated into the Death Troopers, or the cyborg versions of the Dark Troopers. It's also important to remember that the clones that carried out Order 66 retained their memory of the event and all of the love they had for their Jedi. Even if they were not privy to the conspiracy revealed by Fives, even if they didn't understand the Jedi's innocence like Rex, these memories still must have haunted the clones that did fire their bolts into their Jedi friends as General Zay even noted that the bond between Bly and Ayla was closer than most. But that's it for the complete life of Commander Bly. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, please hit that like button. Subscribe if you want to see more, and share the video where you think people will be interested. All that's the best way to help support the channel. But you can also check out the description for affiliate links to things like free audiobooks from Audible, discounts on awesome metal print art, and our Meta Nerds merch. There's also links to our PayPal and Patreon. I want to say special thanks to all of our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier, Chris Garcia, Cass Costello, Matthew Beltrami, and Bill Payne. But most important of all, remember, if Bly could have just been hit a little harder, maybe Aelis Akur would still be with us, and the Force will be with you, always.